The English county of Suffolk is one of the most attractive regions of southern England. And many of its physical features have hardly changed in centuries. We know what this rural landscape looked like in the early 19th century because it provided the inspiration for an artist considered to be one of the greatest of the English masters, John Constable. A constable, I suppose, remains best known as the painter of the archetypal image of the British countryside. But um, although that is a considerable achievement in itself, we should also remember that there was a very genuine freshness to his work, particularly in his studies, and he really did um, introduce new ways of studying and describing nature, which to some extent had much wider implications than simply the celebration of the English countryside. His paintings are to be seen in many, many galleries, particularly the National Gallery and, and the Tate over here. His best pictures, I think, are really those which concern the landscape of, uh, of Suffolk uh, in, its, in its most uh, pristine state. Constable's main achievement was to draw attention to and um, persuade people to appreciate the simpler, humbler aspects of um, nature, of the countryside, because after all, um, in the earlier part of the 18th century, with its emphasis on the picturesque, nature was something which was to be uh, manipulated in painting. Uh, and he, very much, the message was from Constable that uh, landscape should be appreciated in its own right. John Constable was born on June 11, 1776, in East Bergholt, a Suffolk village near the River Stour. The Stour was important to Constable's father, Golding. He was a successful corn miller, whose produce was taken by river to the coast and then down to the bustling markets of London. The Constable family were well off, and Golding's wife Anne bore him six children, of whom John was the fourth. Constable was educated locally, at the school in Dedham, a village on the other side of the Stour. His interest in art led him to become friends with John Dunthorne, village glazier and amateur painter. When Constable was 19, he became acquainted with a more significant artistic figure, Sir John Beaumont, also an amateur painter, but a man with far greater influence than a rural craftsman. Importantly for Constable, Beaumont owned a European painting, Hagar and the Angel, one of the finest works of a 17th century French master, Claude Lorrain. We should remember that while on the one hand Constable is painting his native countryside, he still very much believes in the traditions of art and he believes in the qualities of design, composition, observation of light and all those other um, qualities that he felt Claude had managed to master in his landscapes. Hagar and the Angel has a vertical format. Landscape is usually a horizontal format. And this vertical format was relatively unusual. And in it, Claude had explored, as always, his classicizing way of making a picture, that is, framing trees at the foreground, uh, a great recession into distance. And Constable's response to this is definitely to be found in some of his works, like Dedham Fail where he also used the unusual vertical format and where, although he doesn't have a biblical subject, instead he has the subject of Dedham Church. Hagar and the Angel was not the only work to inspire Constable. He also admired the achievements of a fellow man of Suffolk, Thomas Gainsborough, an English master whose life had only recently ended. Gainsborough's portraits were famous across England, but his real passion had been for the then unfashionable art of landscape. 
Constable was impressed. Gainsborough was very much interested in landscape painting, but of course he had to make a living. So he mainly earned his living through painting portraits. But uh, whenever he had the opportunity, he used to escape to the countryside and, uh, and paint there. Gainsborough had died um, when Constable was a very young boy and he wouldn't have known him personally. But Gainsborough at that time, perhaps rather surprisingly, um, had a reputation more as a landscape painter than as a portrait painter. And he was seen as the person who had, so to speak, first made the portrayal of British landscape interesting. In 1799, Constable spoke of seeing Gainsborough in every hedge and hollow tree that he saw in Suffolk. He was now convinced of his destiny as an artist. In 1799, John Constable persuaded his father to let him follow in Gainsborough's footsteps. That year, he travelled to London to study at the Royal Academy. At 23 years old, Constable took rooms near what is now Oxford Street and quickly set about his academy studies. This self-portrait in pencil was drawn shortly after his arrival in London, a small image whose interest lies in its subject matter rather than any great display of technique. Constable was a troubled student. His art was unremarkable he missed Suffolk, and he soon realised that his ambitions to be a landscapist were at odds with the tastes of the academy. But he stuck to his guns. In May 1802, he wrote to his old Suffolk friend, John Dunthorne, his words famously summing up what he intended to achieve as an artist. I shall return to Bergholt where I shall endeavour to get a pure and unaffected manner of representing the scenes that may employ me. There is room enough for a natural peinture. I think he thought that there were enough people painting portraits and uh, history pictures and that sort of thing, and uh, that there were very few people in England actually painting landscape pictures, and um, he felt that he had to pursue that aim for himself. The hierarchy of painting rated landscape fairly low, in any case, lower than the history subject and lower than the portrait. And the only way to elevate landscape was to combine it with mythologies or with biblical text. This was not for, for Constable. He was far more interested in the particularity of nature, in its, its true colours, its true formations. He said that there was far more moral feeling in a landscape than in the shaggy posterior of a satyr. In the summer of 1802, Constable bought a cottage in Dedham and began the pursuit of his radical artistic aims. That year, he painted this view of Dedham Vale, a scene that he was deeply familiar with from his boyhood. The arrangement of the painting was decisively influenced by Claude's Hagar and the Angel, but we can also see here the first signs of Constable's own naturalist approach. At the time, landscapes were normally brown in tone. An 1802 viewer would have been surprised at the dominance of green in this small canvas. Constable's own artistic identity was forming, but it would be many years before it would reach full maturity. One problem for Constable was that landscape painting of any sort was still the poor relation of portraiture and history painting. Often the would-be landscape artist was compelled to turn to portraiture to pay his bills, just as Gainsborough had been forced to do. But the portraiture of Constable would never approach the achievement of his Suffolk predecessor. All his ambition was tied up in his landscape work, 
One point that Constable emphasised was he was particularly interested in landscape in relation to man. He wasn't interested in landscape painting that didn't show the effects of man, didn't show human habitation. It was man living in the landscape, so to speak, that fascinated him. And this perhaps, from his point of view, made landscape seem all the more serious because it was about a way of life. I think in raising all our perceptions of what landscape painting is about in approaching nature with fresh eyes and in lifting that once humble genre to something of much greater uh, breadth of interpretation uh, and breadth of meaning. He believed that nature was the work of a, a benign God and in that way he invested his landscapes of his native Suffolk with a spiritual meaning and I think that this spiritual dimension is extremely important in our understanding of what appears to be the humble and the everyday. In the early 19th century, it was common practice for aspiring landscape painters to make sketching expeditions, and Constable was no exception to the rule. He visited England's Peak District, and then, in 1806, the most rugged and overwhelming region of England, the Lake District. When he returned to his winter lodgings in London, he painted a number of Lake District landscapes, including this view of Keswick Lake, a work shown at the 1807 Royal Academy exhibition, as a number of his earlier works had been. Constable was now in his thirties, he was still unmarried, and paintings such as this had failed to secure him fame or fortune. His response was a decision of massive significance. To concentrate his efforts totally on painting the Stour Valley, the land where he grew up, the scenes of his own careless boyhood. I think the reason why Constable chose to paint such a specific area of England where he'd grown up was because he was deeply in love with it. And, um, and he, not being ambitious like Reynolds, he, as long as he could, could make a living, he thought that he would stick with what he knew, what he loved, and, um, and show that as truthfully and honestly as possible. His family were um, middle-class people. His father, Golding, had uh, a mill, a corn mill, and he had to pull his weight uh, with, the, with the corn merchant's business and, uh, and other things, I think. Also, he was a very conservative sort of person. Um, he, um, he, he, liked, uh, he liked Suffolk and the area around it and all things wet, as he described them. In 1809, Constable began to settle into the routine that would define much of his working life. He spent winters in London, working on his canvases, and summers in Suffolk, sketching the Stour Valley. Over the following years, these sketches contributed to his artistic evolution. But as Constable began this journey towards greatness, his personal life was thrown into turmoil when he fell in love with a local girl, Maria Bicknell. It was the beginning of a nightmare courtship. Maria was 12 years younger than Constable. She had known him since childhood, but she was already 21 by the time she fell in love with him. Although they both wanted to marry, the Bicknell family disapproved of Maria's involvement with a struggling painter, and her formidable grandfather, Dr. Rudd, was implacably opposed to the relationship. Rudd was an influential local figure, an old man who devoted his energies to keeping the two lovers apart. At times he succeeded, with Constable's winters in London only making his task easier. For Constable, it was a desperate situation, but he refused to give up hope of eventual happiness with Maria. Several years passed, with both sides taking up ever more entrenched positions. By 1813, 
this unfortunate village dispute was still no nearer a resolution. But Constable could draw consolation from his growing artistic success. That summer, he sketched the Stour Valley landscape, but he worked with a passion bordering on obsession. The dozens of small pencil drawings that survive represent an exhaustive and technically solid visual record of the rural environment he knew so well. Constable started to produce sketches in paint. Around 1811, he created this small oil sketch, showing Flatford Mill as seen from a lock on the River Stour. Around the same time, he painted this small sketch, depicting river barges approaching another lock. These open-air studies were unusual for the time, but their importance to Constable's evolution as an artist cannot be overstated. It was through works like these that he learned the subtleties of capturing the light, colour and especially atmosphere that would characterise his greatest work. He enjoyed oil sketches much more than the finished pictures because that meant that um, as with all sketching, whether it's drawing or painting, that you can get a feeling of movement, immediacy, freshness generally. The use of oil allowed him to exploit that particular medium, particularly for its colour, and to capture the, the depth of colour of transient effects. Capturing, using his brush with the oil paint in a directional way so that his clouds and trees seem to bend with the wind. In 1815, Constable decided to take his open-air oil sketching one stage further. That year, he painted another familiar landscape. This image depicts his father's boatyard, where we can see a barge under construction, a typical scene in the Stour Valley of the time. The real difference was that Constable painted this scene in the open air. The habit of painting out of doors was well established by his time and most landscape painters would do some degree of plan air painting as it's called so that they could sharpen up their sense of atmosphere and colour uh, and freshness. Um, but nobody took it to the extent that Constable did. One of the problems for him was how far could he take that experience into what he would call a finished picture. Could he actually make a complete relationship between his obsession with studying the effects of nature um, in all these oil paintings and other things and a finished painting? I think that he was aiming at an even fresher approach than he'd already achieved. But I think it's also important to understand that he had already made a large number of sketches in pencil, little quick compositional ideas and rather more detailed drawings of certain elements that would go into the finished painting. It wasn't that he came with an empty canvas and immediately plunged in. That year, he painted two more canvases, which reveal his increasing maturity. This is Golding Constable's kitchen garden, one of two views of Constable's father's land. The other is a depiction of his flower garden and was painted exactly as Constable saw it. Nothing is idealized. After many years, Constable was beginning to fulfill his artistic ambition. This is natural peinture. Constable was very concerned that he was painting um, the real world, the world that he experienced. And perhaps this is a very central point for Constable. He believes his art is about recording experience. In the, in the pictures that he exhibited in the Academy, uh, those were paintings painted in the studio, uh, but they were based on studies that he'd made out of doors. And it's probably no exaggeration to say that uh, more than any other painter at, his t uh, at the time, uh, Constable based his finished pictures on 
direct study of nature. He said how he loved the, the, the countryside around Suffolk and he, uh, he particularly liked the sound of, of water going through mill dams and um, he liked willow trees and uh, old broken planks and that sort of thing. So he was very keen on landscape as a subject. That year, Constable's personal life underwent radical change. In 1815, his mother Anne died, and Constable was too distraught to attend her funeral. His devotion is clear in his portrait of her. He also painted a fine image of his father, to whom he was similarly attached. Sadly, in May 1816, Golding Constable also died and it is thought that the real cause was a broken heart. The death of his wife had broken his own will to live. Golding Constable's death had one positive consequence for his artist son. Constable inherited an income of 400 pounds a year and he grew even more determined to marry Maria Bicknell. On the 2nd of October, 1816, after seven long years of traumatic courtship, their wedding took place at St. Martin's in what is now Trafalgar Square. Although Maria's family still disapproved of the marriage, Constable was 40 years of age and about to enter the happiest years of his life. In October, 1817, Maria gave birth to John Charles, and six more children followed in the next 11 years. In this panel from 1820, we can see Maria Constable with John Charles and his baby sister, Maria Louisa. But by the time this portrait was created, John Constable was approaching his artistic peak in the genre that he loved most, landscape. This is Flatford Mill, which was exhibited at the Royal Academy of 1817. It is a warmer image than the boat builders, and it is four times as large, a clear reflection of Constable's increasing ambition. Constable was not even an associate member of the Royal Academy. These were the artists who had the right to the best hanging positions at the annual exhibition. For a non-member to make an impression, a large canvas was essential, and Constable knew it. Flatford Mill represents the last stepping stone towards the large-scale landscapes on which Constable's fame still depended, the six-footers. It does reflect um, Constable's increasing confidence and to a certain extent his ambitions. And of course it meant that given the size he was able to uh, put in all the detail that he wanted. Constable started exhibiting these large six-foot canvases um, in his mid-career. He probably started doing this um, because he felt that that was ultimately what his art should be about. Um, although he was the pioneer painting a more naturalistic kind of landscape, he still nevertheless believed in what one might call the, the epic picture. You might say professionally it was important to him because the sheer physical size of these objects made them visible in a way that his other work had not been. It seems to be not a coincidence that after he had exhibited his first successful six-footer, the White Horse, who became made an associate of the Royal Academy. It was as though the Academy could finally see um, that there was some purpose behind his art, that it had something behind it, because he could do it on the grand scale. In 1819, Constable exhibited the first of his six-foot canvases at the Royal Academy, the White Horse. With the greater picture space, he could include more naturalistic detail without losing the overall harmony of the scene, and the result was a triumph. Artistically and commercially, the white horse was well received, and it sold for 100 guineas, twice as much as Constable had ever received for any of his previous works. 
it was a landmark development in his career. But the upward turn did not stop there. Maria also gave birth to her first daughter, Maria Luisa. Shortly afterwards, the constables moved to what was then the North London village of Hampstead. By November, Constable was elected an associate member of the Royal Academy. 1819 had been a good year for him. Constable was not complacent. And over the next six years, he painted a succession of large landscape paintings. In the summer, he sketched his beloved Suffolk. In the winter, he used his sketch material as the inspiration for one big six-foot landscape to be shown at the Academy exhibition in the spring. Amongst them, possibly the most famous of all English paintings. This was not the full extent of Constable's work. He also used his time painting places in North London, the image of the Branch Hill Pond on the famous Hampstead Heath being one example. Earlier landscapes, such as Flatford Mill, had proved that Constable was able to convey a strong sense of atmosphere through his sky painting. In Hampstead, he pursued this branch of his art further, with a series of cloud studies, including this oil sketch of Stratocumulus Cloud, or, more dramatically, this larger study of far more menacing clouds from 1822. There had been cloud painters before, but um, they had perhaps looked at the sky more in terms of a compositional effect, we should say, rather than a sense of the individuality of the clouds. He owned or borrowed us somehow a book by Luke Howard called The Climate of London, and that actually influenced his painting of, uh, of clouds. Well, that seems to have excited Constable because it gave him the sense of the cloud as the individual, as you might say. Uh, clouds weren't just sort of patterns in the sky. They were actually the result of particular effects, and they had their particular shapes and forms. And that's when he starts exploring it. Stormy skies were a recurring feature of Constable's work in London, notably in this small canvas entitled The Grove, Hampstead, but more widely known as The Admiral's House. The sky is a reminder of a famous comment on Constable made by the London-based Swiss painter Henry Fuseli. He said that although he loved Constable's work, it made him want to put on his coat and umbrella no previous English artist had ever captured the experience of the weather so effectively. He certainly understood the importance to an agricultural community of weather. He spent a year in his teens working in his father's mill, so he knew that sudden wind or terrific rain, how dangerous that that could be, how it could really interrupt work and threaten the economy. This 1821 canvas is not a London scene. Instead, it is the six-foot painting that was exhibited by Constable at the Royal Academy that year. The artist's name for the work was simply Landscape Noon. But it was soon given the name by which it is widely known, the Haywain. This image represents Constable's conscious development of his art. Every trademark feature of his work is here. It was the subject of a full-scale oil sketch. Its sheer size never fails to impress, and the ever-changing shape and movement of the clouds is remarkable. Some students of Constable believe that these clouds were seen by the artist during a sketching session in Hampstead, before being incorporated into a complete landscape painting. The whole canvas is suffused with atmosphere and light, especially amongst the foliage of the centre middle ground. 
it is a natural painting of a scene that the artist knew from the very depths of his memory. The cottage on the left, which can still be seen today, belonged to a farmer, Willie Lott, who knew Constable all his life. There is something deeply moving about seeing this small cottage in reality, knowing its contribution to the history of landscape painting. But this building is not the real subject matter here. It is not even the haywain in the centre of the Stour that gives the painting its famous title. The whole of the landscape is what Constable sought to convey. It does seem to be the epitome of Constable Suffolk. But the reason why it remains, I think, in artistic terms, a magnificent painting was because all that Constable had been striving towards throughout his career really come to a kind of culmination in that work. It seems to give that quintessential image of the dream of the countryside, the calm, the tranquility. There's the hayway in the water. There are these lovely tall trees. Everything's very harmonious and fits together. And perhaps, to some extent, it just happens to be a place where he's managed to finally crack it in terms of design, to get something that fits very, very harmoniously together, and which there seems to be a perfect relationship between the balance of the composition and the sense of tranquility in the picture itself. He didn't actually draw the Haywain himself. He got John Dunstable to draw it and send it to him to be incorporated into the picture. So you have several strands in that picture. You have the water and the haywain resting in the water. And then in the distance there are these figures uh, harvesting. So it's a very interesting sort of picture. Um, and I think quite often we don't really realise how, how marvellous it is. The haywain was the culmination of Constable's artistic development. But when it was first shown in 1821, it failed to find a buyer. It soon found some significant admirers, including the French romantic painter Théodore Géricault. And the painting was eventually purchased by a French art dealer. It was then shown at the Paris Salon exhibition of 1824, where it stole the show. It won the gold medal and made a powerful impression upon the second giant of French romantic painting Eugène Delacroix. They would have appreciated the fact that um, his approach was fresh and honest and exact, whereas so much of their landscape painting um, was idealised. I think that with the Haywain, it becomes regarded more and more as what you might call almost the classic image of the English countryside. The more people become urbanised, the more they seem to need this image of the fresh and calm view of nature that it presents. And perhaps that's the reason why it goes on being popular, um, something that perhaps has very little to do with that initial success it had, except for that in both cases it's indicating a sense of freshness and rural calm. The success of the Haywain proved the value of Constable's commitment to natural peinture. He had triumphed over professional and personal difficulties, and he had now earned the respect of great fellow artists. His strong faith in his own artistic vision can be seen as admirably romantic in nature, but it did cause problems at times, as when he was commissioned to paint this view of Salisbury Cathedral. When the work was completed, the Bishop of Salisbury was unhappy with the trademark Constable Sky. He wanted the clouds removed, but Constable stood firm, arguing his case in correspondence which survives to this day. A series of letters that show that the artist was fully aware of his own value and prepared to defend it in argument. Once again, this is an admirable trait. But there is no doubt that, on occasions, Constable's self-belief did lapse into arrogance and hostility. I think it might be possible to 
described Constable as being rather insular. He, he never left England. Uh, indeed, I think he would probably have preferred never to have left Suffolk. He was not someone who was easy in company. He was really, on the whole, rather, rather awkward, rather sensitive. He was quite melancholic, and this comes out very much in his last years when he felt very isolated and rather embittered by what he felt was not uh, being, receiving the kind of treatment he deserved. He could be quite sharp and waspish in his criticism. So one feels there's another side to Constable. His public face is very much of the absolutely decent English gent, uh, and yet I think there's a hint of something a little sharper there as well. His friend, John Fisher, um, in a letter described him as being rather irascible and very short-tempered and uh, inclined to take offence. So whether this was so, I'm not quite sure. But he had a rather hard life. Um, he didn't become a, a Royal Academician until he was 54, for example, whereas Turner was an Academician at the age of 27. I think these factors uh, rather went against him, and so he, he got rather disturbed from time to time. Constable may have been moody and difficult, but by the mid-1820s, he had one valid reason for being unhappy, a reason reflected in his later work. This is Chain Pier Brighton, an 1827 canvas which represents Constable's finest achievement in the difficult art of seascape but Constable hated the seaside resort culture that he found in Brighton. The only reason he was there was for his wife Maria, who was gripped by tuberculosis. He took Maria to Brighton for her health and in, in her last months he executed a number of paintings there. It was a place that he absolutely loathed. He referred to it as Piccadilly on Sea. The sky, the stormy sky, the evil weather would have been, in a sense, very much a part of Constable's own mood of desolation at the time. In January 1828, Maria Constable gave birth to her seventh and last child, Lionel. She died at the end of 1828 and Constable described Maria's death as having completely changed the face of his world. While Maria was still fighting for her life, her husband continued to paint his Stour Valley landscapes. This 1825 canvas, The Leaping Horse, shows Constable experimenting with a greater richness in his application of paint at the expense of the detail that had characterized his earlier six-foot works. But the result is still warm and natural. Constable continued to paint after the death of his wife. Like many of his later landscapes, this is a watercolor depicting the stormy coast at Littlehampton. Constable succeeded in capturing the brooding intensity of the storm clouds, but the overall effect is far more forbidding than in his earlier oil landscapes. An example of this is the watercolour Old Serum, from 1834. It is a profoundly desolate scene, no doubt influenced by Constable's failing health as well as the loss of Maria. There is, you might say, a, a little bit of a paradox here. Um, Constable sees himself on the one hand as being the scientist. He is the person who is exploring nature and wanting to capture all the moods in an objective way, to study the forms of nature. Yet at the same time, he believes in a kind of basic empathy between man and nature, what he calls the moral feeling of nature. And so therefore nature is about mood and landscape painting is about mood as well. Now, in his earlier life, he's wanting to show nature in its finest form. He's wanting to show tranquility and calm. And later on, he seems to want to show different moods. Um, in one level, one can say this is an ambition. He is intensely aware of a sense of rivalry with Turner, who, quite frankly, was by far the more famous painter at the time. Um, but 
he does express the idea that he wants to show that his art can have the kind of dramatic range that you find in Turner's work. So one reason for him beginning to paint storm clouds and, and different effects is his interest in wanting to show that he can command that range. He's actually a greater artist. He's not just a painter of tranquil Suffolk scenery. He can paint the plains. He can paint uh, the drama of nature. Constable's later years were not without their consolations. He had his seven children, whom he adored. His family lived in a fine property in Hampstead, and his wealth was boosted by a large inheritance received by Maria shortly before her death. By the beginning of the 1830s, Constable had also been elected a full member of the Royal Academy and although he felt it was long overdue, this professional recognition meant a great deal to him. Constable's new status meant that he could exhibit his work in the best positions at the Academy exhibition. Often, this work took the same subject matter as so many of his earlier paintings, the Stour Valley of Suffolk, a region which was being referred to as Constable Country, even while the artist was still alive. The Valley Farm is a familiar image, an unmistakably autumnal image. It was a commercially successful image. Its price of 300 pounds at the 1835 Academy was a reflection of Constable's elevated status. The 1836 Academy exhibition would be Constable's last. That year, he exhibited this stark canvas. The Cenotaph, a chilly image which represents Constable's tribute to a previous English master, the man who had been the founding president of the Royal Academy whose membership meant so much to Constable. One can see uh, throughout Constable's life there is a sense of debt to Reynolds and in his own letters Constable is constantly quoting from Reynolds. So I think although Constable, shall we say, disagreed with the Academy in the sense that he wanted to give um, a higher status to landscape painting and particularly to the painting of local landscape which the Academy found hardest to accommodate because that seemed the humblest kind of landscape painting. Nevertheless, he was still indebted to the Academy for having given him a sense of the dignity of art and also for initiated his serious training. But the 1836 Academy also featured a constable watercolour and this melancholy almost expressionist image of the famous Stonehenge may give a better clue as to Constable's artistic ideas as his life neared its end. Here I think he's harking back to a distant time and he's wanting to show, I think, the way in which time passes, things change, this sense of ruin, um, so to speak. So that it's almost as though he's sort of saying we're part of a historical process. Things are going on, things are changing. Um, this is where Britain was once, this is the past, and now it's going on into other things. So I think it's part of a, a, an idea um, to actually show historical development and historical change. Stonehenge, the painting of Stonehenge, is also uh, a part of a landscape which contains the double rainbow. A rainbow effects were thoroughly understood by Constable. We find him sketching in his Hampstead years when rainbows occur, noting the colours, and as he does with clouds, discarding the theories about light and colour in rainbows that he felt were nonsense. John Thorne's book on Constable Skies also explores the idea as to whether the, the rainbow might, in this case, have a deeply symbolic meaning. The two rainbows, the broken rainbow, can never be linked as Constable on this earth can never again be linked with his wife, Maria. And so I think the bleakness of the sight of Stonehenge and the 
sorrow of the sky could well be a, re a symbolic reflection of his own mood, his own feelings at that time. Constable died on the 31st of March, 1837, at the age of 60. Shortly afterwards, he was buried next to his wife Maria in Hampstead Parish Churchyard. Over the course of his career, he had slowly and painstakingly trained himself into a painter of the highest order. His landscapes were like nothing ever seen before, and they succeeded in raising the status of the whole genre. The continuing popularity of the countryside that inspired his greatest works is testimony to the genius of John Constable. In the 20th century, perhaps he's tended to have a more conservative image, whereas in the 19th century, one can say that that kind of painting really did suggest something new, a more radical way of getting a natural effect. He is somebody for whom the practice of painting seems to be very central, and maybe this is why we value his sketches so much nowadays, because here you can see a real sense of pictorial innovation and engagement, and uh, that more vigorous side of Constable's work, which does turn up in some of the sketches he did for his full-scale paintings, as well as the studies he made out of doors, connects with this notion that there really was true passion in Constable's painting, and uh, that's why we can actually connect to that sort of almost visceral side of Constable's art, which is to be found there, as well as the tranquil English countryside.